So let's look at what makes a good biofeedback parameter. Well, the most obvious thing is that it's got to change between problem state and the solution state. And muscle tension fits the bill here. You can probably agree, based on your own experience, that we tend to be tight when stressed and loose when relaxed. Another parameter that fits the criterion here is heart rate. The heart tends to pound and race under stress, at least acute stress, and then slow down again as we calm down. But the parameter also needs to be easily felt subjectively. What you're doing with biofeedback training is that the external feedback helps you to tune in to your own internal feedback so that ultimately you don't really need the external feedback anymore. And you can probably see that muscle tension meets this criterion, while heart rate isn't so good because it's hard to discern the subtle variations in heart rate associated with everyday emotions. Lastly, you want a parameter that you can learn to influence. Again, muscle tension fits the bill because you already have some influence over it. It's easy to let go of high tension, or at least partially let go of it. So let's come back to the muscle tension measurement. What we measure is called EMG, or electromyography. It's an electrical correlate of muscle tension. Physically speaking, it's a voltage. What we're actually measuring is the strength of the signal firing in the nerves that control the muscle. The stronger this signal is, the more the muscle fibers tighten up. Let's just spell out the nature of the mind-body connection here. I've already talked about it to some extent, but the basic pattern is that if we send some kind of threat, then we tighten up. For example, the fists might clench and the shoulders go up. It's a kind of defensive response, as though we're bracing against a coming blow. So, for example, when you're in the dentist's chair being poked and prodded and drilled, it's natural to tighten up. I remember when I first became aware of this, quite a long time ago now, when I realised that I had my feet sticking right up in the air. The interesting thing here is that while we can deliberately and consciously choose to tighten up, to clench our fists and pull up our shoulders, we can also do it quite automatically, involuntarily, in response to emotional stimuli. In the dentist's chair, it's understandable because we fear the physical pain. But we also do it when there's no physical threat, just an emotional threat. For example, suppose a week before you're due for a filling, the thought of it pops into your head. Well, chances are you'll tighten up then and there, even if it's just a little, and even if you don't clearly feel it or notice it. Or imagine yourself waiting to take an exam, or sitting in your performance review meeting with your boss, or wondering if you're going to fluff your golf shot. The point is, there's a physical response as though we're bracing against a threat. Even when there's nothing physical to brace against, the threat is merely psychological. The same thing can happen with bad memories. Say you had a fallout with somebody, or you gave a presentation and it was a disaster. Then the memory of it can keep intruding into your mind, bringing with it the same flood of emotions. When that happens, we'll tend to tighten up, as though bracing against painful emotions. Memories can make us wince, which is of course a tightening up of the face. I think this kind of physical change is key to what makes something feel bad. So the thought of next week's dental appointment, or next week's performance review meeting, can make you feel bad. I think you have to have the physical response for it to actually feel bad, otherwise it's just another thought. Remember, in Module 1 I defined feeling as the perception of a bodily response. The thought that you're going on holiday next week, well that doesn't feel bad because it provokes a quite a different physical response. And the thought that you're going for a haircut next week, well that might not feel like anything much at all if it doesn't trigger a body response. So the idea is, if you can somehow block the physical response, then you can change the feeling too. I think whenever we have an experience that we don't want or we don't like, whether it's a worry or an intrusive bad memory, we're likely to have at least some physical tightening up, as though we could hold off the experience or keep it away from us. I call this resistance or inner resistance, and I think it's extremely common and I think it's an important part of how the mind creates our problems, especially anxiety. Muscle tightening is also likely to be a part of anger and irritation. We tighten up not to hold something off, but in preparation for lashing out against it. Even if we never do lash out. Even if the trigger is just a thought. 
Indeed, you've probably heard of the fight or flight response. That's really what we're talking about here. An aspect of the fight or flight response, but only one aspect, mind, is muscle tightening. So if feeling threatened leads to muscle tightening, the opposite is also true. Loosening, letting go of muscles, goes with feeling safe. I think having an emotional sense of safety or security is not simply the absence of threat, it's a positive emotional state in its own right. And that's something we all need as a resource. We all need to be able to tap into that resource and being able to let go of muscle tension is a useful component of that. I guess for most people it'll be easy to accept the idea that we tense up when stressed or threatened because it's clear and obvious, at least when the stress is strong and overt. But for some people, because of their personal temperament, they're not really tuned into what their body is doing. The body doesn't really impinge much on their awareness because they might be off in the world of thinking rather than feeling. These people might not experience emotions very strongly or clearly. They might find it difficult to know or say how they feel. Even if this isn't you, you probably know people like this. The emotions can still be there. They're just experienced in a different way. For example, if you're angry, you might spend your time thinking about how you've been wronged and not being able to focus on your work or whatever. So muscle tension changes can happen outside awareness and all the more so when the trigger is minor or subtle. The tightening response can be correspondingly subtle and easy to miss. Suppose you're worried about losing your job because your employer is having to make cuts or something like that, or you're worried about not being able to pay your mortgage. These are thoughts that can nag away at us, maybe several times a day or even several times an hour. For ongoing worries, the defensive response, the tightening, can become stuck, can become a habit. And this can be a problem. It's much harder to be aware of a steady state as opposed to a change. So often, muscle tension associated with stress is like the fridge in the kitchen. It's humming away in the background and you think it's all quiet until it switches itself off and only then do you notice it. So all this is really about why it's useful to work with muscle tension. It's possible to refine your sensitivity or expand your self-awareness so that you have more control over this subtle kind of tension. Let's bring it back to our core theme of breathing. We've been talking about how emotional stimuli can trigger bodily change and one part of this is that they affect breathing. So how we're breathing in some way embodies our emotions. To get an idea of this, think of gasping. <gasps> Physically, a sharp intake of breath followed by holding. Typically, it's triggered by a shock or something fearful. Or another example is sighing. <sighs> this is forced or drawn out exhalation. And you can sigh because you're fed up or bored or exasperated, like or you can sigh with relief or with pleasure. And likewise, the stress response affects how we breathe. Later in the module, we'll look at specific breathing patterns associated with stress. Stressed breathing or defensive breathing can become stuck, habitual and un unconscious. And this can be key to the persistence of problems. So in all these examples, we're using the breathing muscles in different ways. Changing breathing involves changing how we use breathing muscles. And as we'll see, a significant part of optimal breathing is being able to fully release the breath or fully release the breathing muscles.